On today's episode, we get our first look at NASA's new direction, the vast space station gears up for science, and Axiom is launching AI into orbit. After months of anticipation, NASA is finally within reach of a new boss. This one will be far from the same as the old boss. He's a billionaire entrepreneur and jet fighter pilot turned commercial astronaut and spacewalker. He's also a close friend of Elon Musk. So what happened when Jared Isaacman went to Washington? Politics. The potential new NASA Administrator's Senate confirmation hearing dragged on for around two and a half hours, most of which was spent dwelling on the close ties with Mr. Musk, which we'll get to, but first let's cut straight to the good stuff. Isaacman was confronted by Texas Senator Ted Cruz. His state is heavily invested in the spaceflight industry, and as such, Cruz has been a longtime supporter of NASA spaceflight initiatives. Now, Mr. Cruz has some concerns about the future of those initiatives under Isaacman. Cruz told the Senate, we must stay the course, in reference to the Artemis moon program, warning, an extreme shift in priorities at this stage would almost certainly mean a red moon, ceding ground to China for generations to come. In response, Isaacman promised senators the moon and Mars, saying, We will prioritize sending American astronauts to Mars. Along the way, we will inevitably have the capabilities to return to the moon. His argument is basically that this is not a binary decision. It's not either moon or Mars, because we're looking at very similar technologies involved in both missions. We're sending people to an inhospitable environment with low gravity with the intention to continue conduct science and establish a permanent human presence. The biggest difference is the distance that those people will need to travel and the duration of their stay. Isaacman said, quote, We could be paralleling these efforts and doing the near impossible. When Cruz produced an illustration to make his point, it showed two futures, an American moon or a Chinese moon, with the title, What Will 2030 Look Like? Isaacman reinforced his commitment to follow through with the existing Artemis plan to land American astronauts on the moon in this decade. And that means using the existing SLS rocket and Orion spacecraft. Isaacman said, This is the current plan. I do believe it is the best and fastest way to get there. But he also threw in a caveat many had been expecting to hear. He continued, I don't think it's the long-term way to get to and from the moon and Mars with great frequency, but this is the plan we have now. Jared was under a unique pressure on this issue because the crew of the Artemis II mission just happened to be in attendance at the confirmation, and Isaac acknowledged them by saying, We've got to get this crew around the moon and the follow-on crew to land on the moon. And speaking of commanding powerful vessels, what if I told you there's a way to take that fantasy out of space and straight into the ocean with a flaming ghost captain at the helm? This video is sponsored by World of Warships, the free-to-play naval combat game where you can command historically accurate warships. And now, not so historically accurate undead ones too. Because yes, the Headless Horseman has officially joined the game. He's bringing his own cursed commander and a ghostly ship skin that glows like it's powered by pure nightmare fuel. Honestly, it's probably the most metal thing ever added to a naval sim. If you're new to the game, hit the link right at the top of the description and use the invite code HEADLESS to get 7 days of premium time, 1.5 million credits, 500 doubloons, the spooky headless horseman himself, that cursed ship skin that works on any ship, and a free ship of your choice once you've completed 15 battles. Yeah, it's a whole haunted fleet starter pack. And look, World of Warships is genuinely fun. The ships are crazy detailed, the battles are packed with strategy, and the game drops new missions and updates every week. It's a great excuse to yell broadside at your monitor like a naval maniac. So if you've ever thought, I'd like to dominate the ocean with the help of a mythological undead maniac, this is your moment. Click the link in the description, use code HEADLESS, and go turn some enemy ships into haunted scrap metal. Now, you may or may not have picked up on some coded messages that Jared may or may not have been sending through his answers. And if such a message existed, it would say that he's willing to tolerate the existing Artemis plan as a hedge against the immediate threat of a Chinese moon landing. 
But beyond that, he's ready to align his priorities with Elon Musk and the Mars colonization effort, which would be supported heavily by the SpaceX Starship vehicle. But SpaceX is going to need a lot of help with the logistics, and NASA will be there to provide. But there's another elephant in the room, the International Space Station. Does Jared align with Musk on the future of the ISS? Because if so, that would mean imminent destruction of the only non-Chinese space station in existence. Musk has stated publicly that he feels the ISS holds no value and should be deorbited as soon as possible. This is where Isaacman definitively broke rank from Elon. He said to the Senate, I am familiar with Mr. Musk's remarks on that. I would like to understand his rationale behind that. And then he made a very clear statement of his own opinion, saying, I do not believe we should deorbit it now. I think we need to make the most use of the space station while we have it and figure out what we can accomplish in the unique environment of microgravity. A lot was made over this idea that Isaacman could be nothing more than an Elon Musk proxy put in control over the US space program. In a more direct response to where his allegiances lie, Isaacman told the Senate, quote, I want to be absolutely clear. My loyalty is to this nation, the space agency, and their world-changing mission. SpaceX is a contractor. NASA is the customer. They work for us, not the other way around. So in theory, Isaacman is saying all the right things, and around the space community he's widely seen as a good choice to lead the next chapter at NASA. But there's still a pretty big question lingering around what kind of space program he'll be left with. Isaacman might have control over the direction of the agency, but one thing that he doesn't control is the money. And this might be a very big problem in the very near future. We have early and unconfirmed reports that President Trump wants to make a significant cut to NASA's operating budget. The thing about this proposal, if true, is that it would be a targeted reduction, and the target is science. Approximately 50% of the dedicated science funding for NASA would evaporate, leading to some pretty devastating losses. Mars sample return would be finished. The long-suffering Da Vinci mission to Venus would be put out of its misery for good. NASA's next generation space telescope, the Nancy Grace Roman, which is already constructed, would be put on an indefinite pause. This would also force the closure of NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. And those are just the headline-grabbing outcomes. The holistic effect of this budget on the fields of astrophysics and planetary science would be widespread. Now, we're also looking for a reason why. It's not like Donald Trump doesn't care about space. In fact, he seems to love space. There wouldn't even be an Artemis program without Trump. He created the Space Force. He's already announced his intention to build a giant network of missile defense satellites, and he said in his inauguration speech that he wants to put Americans on the planet Mars. The science stuff, however, the really geeky, nerdy kind of thing, that doesn't get as much attention. And Jared Isaacman is not dissimilar in his own priorities. He is a huge enthusiast of human spaceflight. He's put his money and his own ass on the line to further the development of commercial spaceflight programs with SpaceX. But he is not a scientist. And then, of course, there's Elon Musk. Very passionate about going to Mars, building rockets, colonization, deep into the engineering side of things. But also, not a science guy. So if we were to infer what was going on here, we're probably looking at a redirection, a reprioritization of NASA, away from the theoretical and into the practical. The winds of change are blowing strong, so stay tuned for that. Now for those who do care about science, we're jumping back into the story of the vast Haven 1 space station. This is quickly turning into America's next best shot at a functioning outpost in low Earth orbit. Haven 1 is not particularly big or fancy, which is probably the reason why it's progressing so fast. And that's led into the first round of customer payloads that will be on board the space station when it flies to space as early as next year. There's the Japan Manned Space Systems Corporation, which has supported research on Japan's Kaibo module on the ISS. They'll provide a multi-purpose payload facility for microgravity research on Haven 1. 
Interstellar Lab is a French company that will provide an advanced life sciences research facility called Eden 1.0 that will be used for experiments such as plant growth. ExoBiosphere is based in Luxembourg and will fly a biotechnology payload to perform pharmaceutical and healthcare experiments. These new announcements join two previously reported science payloads for Haven 1. There's Redwire Space, which will provide its advanced space experiment processor and Pillbox pharmaceutical experiment platforms, both of which have previously been used on the ISS. And Yuri, a European space biotech company, will provide its science taxi incubator and centrifuge experiments packed for the Haven 1 lab. Haven 1 can host 10 mid-deck lockers for research payloads. Most of those have now been sold to those partners or are being reserved by VAST for use by crews that will visit the space station. Those lockers are the same standard as on the ISS, but with a little bit different aesthetics. On Haven 1, the lockers will be located behind wood paneling on one end of the module that opens up to access the payloads. The idea is that when they aren't using the payloads, the crew can close it and have a more relaxing experience, kind of like a work-life boundary in space. Haven 1 will be visited by four short-duration crewed missions, which VASP will leverage to gain experience for its larger Haven 2 station, which is proposed for development under NASA's Commercial Low Earth Orbit Destinations program. Meanwhile, Axiom is launching AI supercomputers into space. The commercial company will launch two orbiting data center nodes into low Earth orbit by the end of this year. This is the first step in the development of off-planet computing infrastructure. The pioneering satellites will be used to draw data from Earth-observing satellites, drawing on complex AI and machine learning algorithms to speed up the delivery of valuable insights to users on the ground. Currently, satellites need to beam their images to Earth for processing, which introduces delays. Bypassing the need to downlink data to ground stations scattered all around the world will also mitigate security concerns, such as possible interception of data by adversary actors. Although the first orbiting data centers will exclusively crunch data collected in space, some technologists think that power-hungry computing infrastructure would do better in space, where solar power is constant and cooling is easy.